Hi! Today we're going to talk about gravitation, or gravity, that is. We have two goals for today. We're going to talk about something called Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation. So we've talked a lot about Newton in this course and his various laws of motion, but this is a very famous law that, he's, uh, that kind of goes along with that famous story of Newton and the apple falling down on his head. And then realizing that uh, the same force that it keeps attracting things to the Earth is also keeping the Earth going around the Sun and the Moon around the Earth and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a universal law in the sense that it, it applies everywhere in the universe. And secondly, we'll talk about a more general form of gravitational potential energy than the MGH form that we have used so far in this course. Okay, so Newton's law of universal gravitation. This is how it goes. We have two objects. They have mass lowercase m and uppercase m. Their centers of gravity are separated by some distance r. So they exert, via the force of gravity, they exert attractive forces on one another. Of course, each object exerts the same force on one another. The forces are equal and opposite, in other words. So Newton's third law still works here. So the magnitude of the gravitational force is given by this. F is capital G, that's some constant, we'll talk about the value of that in a minute, multiplied by the product of the masses, divided by the distance between them squared. Okay, so that's how you get the magnitude of the gravitational force. And big G is known as the universal gravitational constant, and it's a pretty small number in the uh, SI unit system. It's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Okay, so this is not little g, this is big G. Whole new thing. And of course the direction that the force is exerted on one object by a second object is just directly back toward that second object. Okay, the force is an attractive force, always, with gravity. Okay, so, We've so far used a force equation which is a lot simpler than Newton's universal law of gravitation. We've never used big G mm over r squared yet. All we've done is we've used a much simpler form, this mg thing. And these two things have got to be consistent with each other. Okay, so when you're at the surface of the Earth, we can get away with writing just m times little g. But m times little g has to be the same as big G times little m times big M divided by r squared. So we can set these equations equal to each other. One thing you notice is that little m cancels out. Little m could be the mass of you if you're interacting with the Earth, or the mass of some phone you're carrying, or whatever. Okay, so you set these equations equal to each other. Little m cancels out. And what you get left is where g comes from. So g is 9.8 meters per second squared. We don't just make this up out of nowhere. It actually can come straight out of this Newton's law of universal gravitation. So we get big G, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Mass of the Earth, almost 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, almost. And the radius of the Earth is a little more than 6 million meters. And you got to square that distance, of course. 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters, all squared. Put all those numbers together, and you get 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's where little g comes from. Okay, so consider this question. So if you use that equation, g m m over r squared, you can see that the bigger you make that distance r, the smaller the force gets. Okay, so if we start with an object far away from the Earth and then bring it closer and closer to the Earth, gravitational force gets bigger and bigger and bigger as r steadily goes down. Okay, so let's say we bring it right to the surface of the Earth, and then we keep going. We tunnel right into the Earth, and we keep digging with our tunnel all the way to the center. So what's the force of gravity on our object if we place it right at the exact center of the Earth? And I'm only going to give you two things to pick from, and they're quite different from one another. One is force of gravity is zero. Two force of gravity is infinite. So if you think about what happens in the equation, gmm over r squared, well, r is going to zero. If you take r towards zero in the denominator, it kind of blows up the equation to infinity. So that's where the infinity answer comes from. 
Where does the zero answer come from? Well, if you look at kind of a free body diagram of the object, and you place it right in the center, then you've got mass on all sides of you symmetrically, and all that mass is pulling in sort of equally in all directions. So the net force should in fact be zero. So what is the right answer, zero or infinity? And it turns out that the kind of uh, free body diagram way of looking at things is the correct way. So everything cancels out. So then we got to figure out, you know, what's wrong with our equation. GM over R squared says R, is, R goes to zero, the force goes to infinity. But it turns out that that works as long as the two objects are not inside one another. Okay? When one object is inside the other one, then you got to use a different system. Okay? So make sure you only apply F is GMM over R squared when you've got the objects not inside one another, one object not inside the other one. Okay? Okay, so then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we call the gravitational field, which sounds new, but it's just actually a new name for something we're familiar with. So we have called g, little g, the acceleration due to gravity. So now I'm just going to change the name of it and say it's actually the gravitational field. And g with a vector is the gravitational field. g without a vector is the magnitude of the gravitational field. Okay, and what is a field? Well, it's the force, gravitational force, per unit mass that an object experiences when it is placed at that point. Okay? So, here's the force per unit mass, force over mass. That's g, little g. And if you do force units over mass units, you have newtons per kilogram. So at the surface of the Earth, where we have g is 9.8 newtons per kilogram, That's those are totally consistent units with meters per second squared. Those are interchangeable. Newtons per kilogram is the same as meters per second squared. So what it means is if you have a 10 kilogram object and you've got 9.8 newtons for every kilogram, then you're going to have every kilogram gets you 9.8 newtons. If you have 10 kilograms, you got 98 newtons worth of force on you. So we use this idea of field. Now, we're not going to use it much this semester. In fact, we're not really going to use it at all this semester. But when we get to next semester and talking about electric fields, it'll really be an important concept. OK? OK, how about potential energy? So we're used to using MGH. Well, we're going to throw that out the door, too. So basically, we're replacing Mg by GMM over R squared. That's a much uh, more uh, universal equation. And we do the same thing with MGH. We're not going to use MGH anymore. We're going to use something else. And it's this. It's the uh, potential energy, gravitational potential energy is minus big G mm over R. Okay? What does this minus sign mean? Well, the negative sign simply tells us that the interaction is attractive. That's all it's representing. And when we did MGH, we said, hey, you're free to choose your zero to be anywhere you want. Well, that's not true for this form of the potential energy equation. Okay? If you set R equal to infinity, you get these two masses really far away, then they're not interacting anymore, then the energy of their interaction goes to zero. So it's actually sort of defined, the zero is defined in the equation itself. So when R goes to infinity, when the masses are very far apart, the potential energy is zero. You are not allowed to choose a zero yourself anymore. Okay. Now, somehow this minus GMM over R equation has to be consistent with our MGH equation, and it turns out that it is. And then what matters really is change in gravitational potential energy for very small changes in height near the Earth's surface. And very small, I mean like a few meters, like we're used to dealing with. That's fine then this equation, minus GMM over R, gives us the same change in potential energy as our MGH equation does. Okay, even the sign. All right? So this new equation is actually consistent with MGH for small values of H at the surface of the Earth. Okay, so let's apply these ideas a little bit. So we got escape speed. What is that? Well, basically, we're going to ask the question, how fast do you have to throw an object up in the air so it never comes back down? And we're going to do something crazy and ignore air resistance, which is clearly ridiculous, but we're going to do it anyway. 
So this speed is known as the escape speed. The minimum speed, in fact, required to escape from a planet's gravitational pull is the escape speed, the minimum speed. So we're going to look for that minimum speed. The lowest speed we have to give an object at the Earth's surface when we throw it up so it never comes back down again. Okay, so how are we going to go about trying to figure this out, this escape speed? Is it a force problem? Or is it an energy problem? Or can we use either one? Well, if you think about it, we're trying to get this thing from the surface of the Earth very, very, very far away. In fact, we're going to let it go all the way to infinity. So the force changes as the distance changes. So we're totally comfortable with dealing with constant force situations. When we get a situation like this, where we get a variable force, pretty hard for us to deal with that. On the other hand, energy. We don't really have to worry about how the thing gets from point A to point B. We just got to worry about what the energy is at point A, what the energy is at point B. So energy is the way to go in this problem. So we will start with our energy conservation equation. Okay, so there's our five term equation. So we write that down then we throw away a bunch of terms. So which terms can we cross out? Well, being crazy a little bit, we're going to assume there are no resistive forces. And we're going to get rid of work done by non-conservative forces. So we set that term to zero. Now we clearly have a bunch of initial kinetic energy because we're starting at the surface of the Earth. And in fact, we have a bunch of uh, initial gravitational potential energy. What about the terms on the right? Well, we want the minimum speed we can launch this thing at. So that basically gets us to infinity with no speed at all. And if you get out to infinity with your object, the object gets infinitely far from the Earth then that's where the potential energy is, is zero as well. So in fact, UF and KF are both zero. So you have a kind of a strange looking equation. It says UI plus KI is equal to zero. And this is where that negative sign in our gravitational potential energy equation kind of saves us. Because one term here is negative, the potential energy, and the kinetic energy is clearly positive as it always is. And we can kind of look at this in pictures. So initially, we have a bunch of negative potential energy, a bunch of positive kinetic energy. Our total energy, total mechanical energy, is zero. If you get infinitely far away, which is why you can't draw this picture to scale, you end up with no kinetic energy, no potential energy, and again, total energy is zero. So you're conserving energy here, even though, though it's a little bit strange. Okay, but it works. Okay, so UI plus KI is equal to zero. Okay, so now we're going to plug some stuff in. Oh, and by the way, if UI plus KI, which is the mechanical energy, is some negative number, then the object does fall back down. If it's zero or positive, then it never comes back. So in our case, it's zero. This is where it switches over from coming back to never coming back. Okay, so we plug in our value for initial uh, gravitational potential energy. So it's minus GMM over R, and R is the radius of the planet. And then k is 1 half mv squared, and we're dealing with not any old v, but the escape speed, so we'll call it v escape. Okay, note once again, the mass of the object cancels out. So you can throw a baseball or a piano with the same initial speed, and they both get away to infinity. Mass doesn't matter. Of course, it's a lot harder to throw the piano than the baseball. Okay, so we solve for the escape speed after canceling out the mass, and what you get when you rearrange and solve for v escape is root of... 2gm over r, and if you plug in the appropriate values, and you can look up the appropriate values because we plugged them in for something else to find little g, in fact, earlier, you find for the Earth, and remember the mass is the mass of the planet, r is the radius, so when we do this for the Earth, we get an escape speed of 11.2 kilometers per second, so that's 11,200 meters per second, we get to launch our baseball off the surface for it to get away never come back. Okay, so that's pretty darn high. Okay, so there's an example, nice example, of applying this gravitational potential energy to an interesting uh, system. Okay, and I think that's all for today.